So without further ado, I'll intro introduce you to one of the most intelligent men in the field. Oh men boy. Put the, put the pressure on me. Man, man. Uh, Mo's a great guy. He's been doing ball, balance hole studies since 1973. USBC just completed their first one. So uh, when I say that there's only one guy in the game truly changing it, it's Mo. Um, I hesitate. I'll hand it right over to him. Thank you. Yep, Joe Hutchinson and I did the first balance hole study in 1973. USBC just completed theirs. I wonder what they were doing. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'll start by saying this was not my idea to change the specs, okay? But without rules, we have chaos, so we need rules, okay? The sky is not falling, okay? What the USBC has done inadvertently is put pressure on the pro shop industry. So we're going to have to rise up to what we need to do with the pressure they put on us, okay? We got to be a little better at what we do. The old put the pin up here and slap a hole over there isn't going to work anymore. So layouts become ultimately important. Understanding the motion characteristics of a bowling ball becomes ultimately important. And the most important thing that's going to happen is you're going to have to make the interview process with your customer more detailed. You've got to get the information out of your customer as to exactly what they want. Because you get one shot at it. I'll give you the scenario that doesn't work. Customer comes in, wants a ball, you talk to him, you decide what you're going to do, you drill the ball. He goes out and bowls with it, comes back and says, that's not bad, that's really close, but I'd like to get a little bit more at the break point or a little more on the back end. Can you help me a little bit? So under the new rules, you adjust the surface a little bit, which doesn't increase the back end, it just might make the break point a little bit closer. So he comes back again, he says, that's a little bit better, but I want more. So you say, okay, you come back tomorrow, I'll have it ready for you. Here's your option. Plug the ball. It's the only option you've got. Okay? So the customer comes back the next day for the $250 ball he bought yesterday. And you hand him a plugged bowling ball. You have plugged his bowling ball, and you have voided his warranty. How many customers are going to tolerate that? That's the bad case scenario. Okay? So we need to use our tools effectively. I'm hoping, and I'm counting on the pro shop industry rising to the stress that the USBC decided to put on us. And I'll remind you again, it wasn't my idea. Okay? Phil, head honcho, he's in his office doing something. I'll be here as the tech guy because this is my, what I do, okay? We had a great seminar yesterday in Chicago. It rocked and rolled. This can rock and roll almost as much, but we're being recorded, therefore PG got to be going on. The new reality of ball motion. The rules have changed. They're not the same anymore. You got two years to make an adjustment here, but the rules have changed. Okay, that's who it is. If you want to get in touch with me, for example, if something happens on the downloading of the flash drive, there's my email address. This is your only shot to write it down. Okay? If you want to get to me on Facebook, it is not a page, it's a person. Radical MOP. Put that in your search bar. You'll see a cartoon character with a blue back background. You click on it, that's where I post. Believe me, I didn't want to do Facebook when I started, but my boss said it's part of your job description. So, 
two and a half to three hours a day I'm on Facebook, which I never figured was going to happen in my life. But I will tell you this, from my point of view, it moves product. It does. It also created the millennial generation. And when you're coaching, that's an interesting thing. How many of you are coaching juniors today? Okay. Prior to the millennial generation, students wanted to learn. Now they want to be right. They'd rather do it their way than learn sometimes. And boy, that's an interesting proposition. You guys that coach kids, you understand, right? Helping a college team, this girl, Bolden High School, not in Michigan, trust me. She averaged 228 in high school. That's pretty good. Older freshman year in college, it got better. She averaged 184. Her mother is still convinced that the coaches at the college ruined her game because she was a 228 average bowler when she came to college. Does everybody here understand what I'm saying? I'll add one more thing to it. How many proprietors we got here? I'm not pointing you out as one of these guys. But 85% of the lanes in the United States are illegal on a daily basis. That's an accurate number. Lanes are legal if you get your inspection correctly one day a year. <laughs> one day a year you have to oil the outside, according to the USBC. There are associations in this country and I know who they are and where they are, some of them are, right? That don't even know where their readers are. So they haven't checked a lane, some of them in three, four, or five years. Okay? This is the best opportunity in the history of bowling for young people to bowl and go to college. If you can throw a bowling ball, especially if you're a young girl, you will probably not pay for your college education. That's the truth. I have a girl that's, graduated, that's just ended her junior year, negotiated it, it's done, it hasn't been formalized yet, but it's there. She's only going to get a $400,000 scholarship because she can throw a bowling ball. That's never been possible in, in the history of bowling. Correct? So bowling has plenty of opportunity. It's the best it's ever been for young people. But they have to learn that what works on a house condition will not work in college. Okay, let's give the USBC some credit. We're going to try. Okay, it's the intent of the specs changed by the USBC. Okay, okay, modern bowling balls. And higher revolution bowling styles require an increasing amount of oil on the lanes. The patterns are changing faster. This trend is not sustainable. Okay. USBC conducted extensive research and surveyed all of the bowling's shareholders. I still haven't gotten my call. Okay. To protect bowling in the future, USBC is eliminating balance holes. Wasn't my idea. Setting a new specification for oil absorption. I'll get to that in a minute. The overall result will slightly limit hook potential, okay? USBC research shows that changes will slow oil pattern transition. I believe that is the case, okay? Cause bowlers to move less. I don't know too many of them that ever move their feet. <laughs> <coughs> I have a friend of mine who's a ball driller and he has a nickname for left-handers. He calls them mud feet because they never move their feet. There you go. Okay. Keep the same scoring pace with lower oil volume. I hope so. No current, U the good part is no current USB-C approved balls will be deemed illegal. All equipment is grandfathered in indefinitely. Balance holes need to be plugged by August 1st, 2020. The goal, understand the word goal, is to Protect the playing environment in the future, not to lower scoring. 
noble intentions. Put it right there. Noble ambitions. Okay? My comment on the next one is time will tell. Okay? We applaud the USBC for not implementing the current oil absorption rule until August 1st, 2020. We consider the oil absorption rule to be a work in progress. We feel that time is needed to further analyze the data to reduce the standard deviation in order to significantly reduce the margin for error on this test. The margin for error on oil absorption test currently is 19.55% plus or minus 20 percent. <laughs> I've talked to many Six Sigma black belts, statistical experts. One of their best is in this town, works for Ford Motor Company. And every person I've talked to, which is more than 10, say that a 19, that a 20 percent error factor is an invalid test. So as it sits, they did good by waiting two years, okay? The good news is, all of your current cover stocks pass. So we don't have an emergency. Let's see what they come up with in two years. I'm not so sure it can be done. I've had people tell me that are experts in rheology or chemistry, they're not so sure this can be done. But I hope they make it. I hope they do it. 20% error is too high. Okay. Remember the USBC says they're not lowering the differential on undrilled balls, correct? That's horse pucky. Just thought I'd tell you. They put a procedural change in. They used to itemize the procedural changes so you could go to the USBC and check on what the changes were. They skipped it on this one. Okay? Any new core designs for approval? Any new core designs that have a differential over 050, total diff over 050, you need to submit eight balls. And the eight balls need to average under 055. Okay? If they average over 055, you have to send them 24 more. So now you're at 32. Now those 24 have to have the same statistical analysis on the total population. So the first set and the second set has to analyze exactly the same. If that doesn't happen, then you get to give them 24 more. So if you want to approve a new core that's over 055, you're only going to have to send them 57 balls. This is not a rule change, it's a procedural change that results in all the designs will be under 055 from now on. Sneaky, aren't they? I'm okay with it. I haven't launched a ball with over 055 diff in six years. Because if I make them 055 undrilled, they flare all around the ball twice. Looks like a basket weave. My comment is, wow. Timeline of specification changes. You guys should have gotten these blue handouts if you went to trade shows because they handed them out all over the place. Without a weight hole, three ounces of static weight on every ounce, on every axis, as of August 1st, 18. If it's got a, it's not a weight hole, it's a balance hole. It's got a balance hole, you have to adhere to the existing statistic, uh, uh, static Wait. Also, if you're a no thumber, you got to put an X on the ball so you know where your palm belongs. I think that's designed to prevent you from using it both ways. And you know those little tri grips they did with no thumbers? They're illegal now too. That's six balls. Okay. This is the one mistake they made in, in nomenclature. Only dry towel will be used with bowling ball during competition. That's not said the right way. The answer is, the rule means no liquids during competition. All your chamois and all your other devices, that leathers that wipe the ball, oil off the ball better, are still legal. You can, if you get a smudge, God, nobody ever went bowling and got a black smudge come back on their bowling ball, did they? 
Anybody ever do that? Okay. If you go to the league secretary, you can have permission to use a liquid to clean the smudge off. Okay, where are we going with this? I'm learning this every day. I've been doing it for three days. They're going to change the rules. We're going to change the tools. That's the way it goes. Without rules and regulations, we have chaos. But I was a drag racer before I was in bowling. Not a national record holder at the age of 14. Does anybody here, and this is Motortown, know what the rule in racing is? That's exactly right. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. No wonder you did good. No wonder we did good. I ain't cheating. I ain't cheating, but I read details and I use words for what they really mean. We don't have to cheat. We just have to be a little better at what we do. The immediate benefit of new ball specs is, thank the distributor's going to love this, pin to CG distance no longer matters. There's no difference in the performance in a one-inch pinout ball and a five-inch pinout ball and a three-inch pinout ball. It don't make no difference. It had to before because you had to get the statics weights right. You don't have to do that anymore. Here's a diagram. Pinout distance versus core shift. If you have a two-inch pinout ball, the core is shifted laterally 0 0.060 inches. That's if it's standard volume around 1,000 cc's. If it's shifted four inches, it's shifted one six oh inches. So the difference between a two inch pin out and a four inch pin out is a tenth of an inch in the core shift. Forget it. Now you just order balls and put holes in them. Except you have customers that are going to say, I want my CG down here. Then after you tell them to go to the bathroom, you'll explain to them, <laughs> okay, that it really doesn't matter. Give credit to those that did it, 19, 2004, 2005. Ray Edwards and Bill Wasserberger, rest his soul, did a video on two different balls, uh, symmetrical balls, one, both, both with the pin out, the same distance, same top weight. One had the CG over by the axis point, the other one had the center of the grip, and they rolled identical, which they do. Let's talk about bowling. What we have to do now is understand what's really going on. There's a lot of mythology sitting in this room that people think happens and they understand why. We're about to break all the myths down. I apologize before we start. Okay. When we started doing this long time ago, I was born before the age of color television, okay? We had a lot of optical illusions that we saw. We didn't have the technology to measure everything as accurately as we can now. With today's technology, it doesn't teach us how to think. It teaches us how to measure, shows us how to measure, so we can draw valid conclusions. Okay? Everything in this presentation is absolutely accurate. And I apologize to you right now if your perception was different than what's in this presentation. Okay. A bowler's delivery results in... Ball's direction, you got to give it direction. Maybe three different directions on three different shots, but you got to give it direction. You got a ball speed. You have a rev rate, the ball does. Ball has axis rotation and tilt. By the way, for all those people who never figured out what axis tilt is, there's a video on the Radical Bowling Technologies Facebook page on how to measure axis tilt. Okay? Bowler, you've got to measure the bowler's PAP at release. Okay? Everything else is caused by the bowling ball, the layout, the bowling lane, and the laws of the universe. Once you let go of it, you are a cheerleader. You are done. I don't care how hard you squeeze your cheeks, you're not going to strike anymore. Okay? And I don't care how much you run it out, you're not going to affect, you're, the breeze from your running it out isn't going to affect the direction of the ball. This is an example of what I deal with in coaching. And we have a lot of coaches here, right? Okay. When I give a lesson, and Mr. Spohn has seen it, and a lot of you guys have seen it, first thing I do is I sit there and watch for five minutes. What I am looking for is tension levels, okay, balance, body parts, 
Okay, we don't want arms and legs going in every direction. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh oh. RG contours of a drilled radical beyond ridiculous. This is a very important part of the game of bowling. They're called RG contours. They're the black rings. This ball is drilled. Once it's drilled and we measure those rings, each one of them represents a ring where all the spots on that ring are of the same RG. So everything on the outside ring is the same RG, everyone on the third one, second one, the inside one. Each spot on that has the same RG. That's critical. You're going to learn about ball motion today. Ryan Mao is the one who does the demo for us. Well, I put his PAP on there. See the blue dot? That's his positive axis point. So, his positive axis point is on that RG contour, <laughs> the blue one. That means that once he lets it go, no matter how much he squeezes it, how much he roots for it, how much he runs it out, the migrating axis is going to follow that blue ring. Once you let go of it, you can't alter the, the motion of the ball. You're done. So, I know that the migratory path of his axis will start at the PAP and go towards the finger holes. That's what causes ball motion, folks. There's Ryan. Just to let you know what our ball thrower looks like. Pretty good player. What we're going to do here is analyze Ryan Mao's delivery measurements. How many of you have I drilled balls for when we did interviews and stuff? How many of you? So you already know what's going to happen now. You've already been through it. Ryan's going to throw the ball. We're going to freeze it on his positive axis point. That's the white dot. Now, let me tell you about positive axis points, including a gentleman who works for another company now who used to work for the USBC. We did a study back in oh, a little over a decade ago. And we're going to drill a bunch of balls and measure forms because they wanted, this is when the USBC was collecting information. So he calls me, I, I, he calls me up, I said, okay, I want to do these four layouts. Okay? I said, what's your PAP? I said, drill them. So he drills him. He says his PAP is five and a half over by three eighths up. So I show up. These balls are drilled for the test, right? Try to save some time, right? Doesn't think that's going to happen, do you? So he throws him. Trace the oil ring, measure it. Mark the PAP. I measure his PAP at four and three quarters over by a half up. He had it at five and a half. He says, oh, no, that's got to be wrong. So I put the big white dot on the axis point. Am I right, Mr. Spohn? Mr. You see, I do it in your place, both of your places every year. And we throw it, and when the ball hits the lane, it's right on that white dot. So we have to redrill all four balls. We have to go get four more bowling balls. Modern bowling balls, changes in fits, changes in ball weights, alter your positive axis points. Check them. Don't make an assumption. You know what happens when you assume. I don't have to tell you, do I? And with modern bowling balls and changes, just their changes in their hands as they age a little bit, their, the PAPs move. I would say that more than 50% of the people bowling in the United States today are bowling with the wrong PAP. And the easiest way to do it, stick that white piece of tape on the ball. There it is. I froze it with the white piece of tape on the ball. Let's enlarge it. We see it? That's his PAP. We're going to measure at Ryan's axis rotation. The axis rotation is how far in from the left edge of the ball is that dot. If it's in the middle of the ball, you have 90 degrees of axis rotation. 
If it's all the way over on the edge, you have zero. That's his axis rotation. Ryan's turns out to be 60 degrees. Now let's measure axis tilt. Okay? How many balls do you think I lay out a day? It's in three digits. It's how many people want something, and every one of most, so a lot of you guys have texted me or called me or Facebooked me or something, right? I do it all the time. Before we had cell phones that did all this neat stuff, they'd call me. They'd say, hey, I need a layout. I'd say, okay, I know your game. What's your positive access point? They can quote it chapter and verse. Most of them were wrong, but they quoted it right away. Okay. Next question was, what's your axis tilt? Silence at the other end of the line. Axis tilt is the most important statistic on the motion of a bowling ball because it gives you your natural length down the lane. Okay? Of all the questions I get, and I get, we know hundreds of them, okay? 65% or more of the bowlers that have problems getting motion on today's lane conditions have less than 11 degrees of tilt. Because guys with less tilt, when the lane starts to hook, your ball hooks the soonest. And when you move left, you never knock down another 10 pin for the rest of the day. Because they listened to their coach who told them to stay behind the ball. If you stay behind the ball, the damn thing will never hook. You can't hook a bowling ball without rotating the axis. Am I correct? And everybody says, well, I've got to stay behind it better. Well, you want to bring your spare ball with you. <laughs> Get it all the time. Well, my coach told me to stay behind it. Good. I'm going to tell you, get around it. Around the side of it. Okay. That angle across the horizontal, that's his axis tilt. Ryan's axis tilt is 13 degrees. The most versatile range of axis tilts is between 12 and 19 degrees. If you're between 12 and 19, you've got versatility and can play patterns and can read transitions. And if you miss, I'd rather have you have more tilt than less. I don't care if they call you a spin biscuit. I can sand that bowling ball or roll it around in the parking lot, and I guarantee you it'll look. The hard ones to do are the ones with less tilt. Let's look at Ryan's delivery. Ryan's delivery results in 17 miles an hour of ball speed, 390 RPMs, axis rotation 60, axis tilt 13. His accurate PAP is five and a quarter over by a half up. If you're going to seriously work with a player and really affect their game, especially if you're developing younger players, Get those stats and check them. Okay, let's measure Ryan's axis migration path. Ryan just handed me a ball that he threw and we're going to trace the different oil rings so we can see how the ball rolled. First thing we're going to do, because they tend to disappear, is we're going to get the last oil ring which is the oil ring at the break point. Okay, because that's the one where there's a little less oil. Then we're going to trace the first oil ring. It's right here. So you got time. That's, I chose to use the Intel because if it's a dark, dull color, and this goes very, very well and easy to do here. Okay, so we got first oil ring, last oil ring. Then if I look carefully, I will see the dry flares, and we'll have the dry, there's even a dot where it hit the pins. We'll get the last dry ring from the pin deck so that we can trace the migratory path of the axis completely. This is what we're trying to do. 
We're going to do this on all the different balls that he threw for this video so that we can show you that the, in reality, the migratory path of the axis, the axis migration path, matches the diagrams that we've shown you on your charts. Okay, here's the positive axis point. Here is, using the armadillo correctly, here is the axis point at the oil line, and here is the axis point at the pins. Okay? Okay, which is up into the ring finger. Now, I expected that because this is a strong layout. This is layout F with the CG positive. So now I'm going to trace the migratory path of the axis. There you go. Migratory path of the axis is right there. There it is. First oil ring, the PAP at the break point, and the PAP at the pins. This will match, for layout F, this will match the chart that you got in your handout. So we'll do that, then we'll measure the distances. You'll see it on the uh, PowerPoint slide that I do, and you'll see what we've done. This is how you learn exactly how a bowling ball rolls after you let go of it and before it hits the pins. With every different ball you own, you might have a different migratory path. The positive axis point can vary from ball to ball, quarter of an inch, a little bit around that area. Believe me, you're not going to miss the layout by that much. Okay? When USBC decided to restrict the flare potential of bowling balls, they agreed with Radical by understanding that the numbers of the drill ball that affect the motion. I always ask this question just for fun. How many people in this room care how an undrilled bowling ball rolls? You can't use those numbers. They don't matter. Every time you put a hole in a bowling ball, you change the numbers. Okay, we'll look at balls by their core dynamics since that's what really affects the shape of the ball motion the most. That's hard for people to understand because they can't see the core. They can see the cover, so it's got to matter. Cover is less important than core. Shape of ball motion is determined by core dynamics. We separate them as to symmetrical and asymmetrical ball designs. Let's look at symmetrical balls first since they've been around the longest. Okay, Ryan, Mao and I are here to do the videos for the seminars that we're doing at the end of this month. And what I'm going to do here is show you how to use a determinator to find the preferred spin axis of a ball. We're going to use the Beyond Ridiculous in this case, and we're going to spin this three times before this video is uh, the seminar is over. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is put the ball in the determinator. Ryan is right-handed, so I use the left-hand column and I get the direction of rotation the same. This is the way the ball would rotate off his hand. Going this way, thumb first and then followed by the fingers. Okay, let's spin it and find out where the PSA of this drilled ball is. Okay, and now I'll mark it. Okay, let it stop. And center of that circle is the preferred spin axis, which you would call the mass bias of this drilled ball. Notice it's nowhere near the line from the pin through the CG. Now, in the videos we're going to do, we're going to put a balance hole in it, spin it again, then we're going to plug the balance hole and spin it again. And we're going to show you how the PSA, which is the mass bias of the drill ball, will move back and forth depending upon whether there's a balance hole in it or not. This is pertinent to the changes in the ball specs. Thank you very much. PSA is actually the high RG axis of the ball. And with symmetrical balls, it is in the thumb. I don't care where you put the CG. Put it next to your sister. Put it next to the 
coffee machine at home, it doesn't matter. It's going to be in the thumb. Why? Because when you drill a hole in a bowling ball, you raise the RG of that spot because you replace bowling ball with air. Air has a specific gravity of 0.013 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay. Is that the same for two-handers with no thumb? It's the same for every bowling ball. If it's a symmetrical ball, it's going to spin. Well, you don't have a thumb. You better spin it and find out where it is. I do not use balance holes for no thumbers. Because in my studies, I've been able to flop the balance hole 90 degrees or 180 degrees in either direction. I never know when it's going to do it. So I prefer, with no thumbers, to not use balance holes. And if it's an asymmetrical ball, I put the pin anywhere from five and three quarters to six and a half inches from the positive axis point. Somewhere so it's going over the great circle of the ball. Because once you get it off that, you're done. I mean, that thing can do some really strange stuff. Okay? We're going to throw this beyond ridiculous. We did it with the, without the balance hole. Well, let's throw it. This is without the balance hole. Okay, we froze it there again. Same video. This is beyond ridiculous. Drill 43 and 3 quarters, 20 with no hole. Okay? Now we're going to get tricky. We're going to spin the uh, Beyond Ridiculous Pearl again. You'll notice we put a balance hole in it. The balance hole is an inch and an eighth drill bit, three inches deep. So we've moved a significant amount of mass. Okay, again, I'll set it up like I did the last time for a right-hander on the left column. So the ball's spinning in the right direction. And we'll turn it on and see how far the PSA has moved. There's the original PSA there. Okay. If you'll notice, the PSA has moved from on the thumb hole to over here, almost in line on the line from the pin through the CG. So this is now the PSA. When we measured it, it moved two and a half inches to the right. Okay, by putting the second hole in the ball, we pulled the PSA towards the second hole because it's now in between both the holes. Okay, go ahead. Will that necessarily be halfway between the two? Nope. Depends on the size of the hole and the density of the part of the ball you hit when you put the hole. There's only one way to know where it is. Spin it. Nope, that, pull, that hole is on where everybody puts them. Between the center of the grip, on the line from the center of the grip through the CG, where it intersects the VAL. At least that's the way we used to do it 20 years ago. Okay? The balance hole moved the PSA two and a half inches to the right. So Ryan's going to go throw it. He moved his feet three boards left and sent it right with the balance hole in it. Okay? The ball changed motion because we moved the PSA of the drilled ball. That's what you're going to learn today. Okay? Okay, go ahead. Ryan Mao has been nice enough to plug the hole with black plug so we can see it. And we will then re-spin the ball to see what kind of an effect that has on the location of the PSA of the drilled ball. It's where the PSA was before we put the hole in. This is where the PSA was after we put the hole in. Now let's see what this did. It returned it about 90% of the way back to its original location. Here's where the PSA was without the hole. Here's where the PSA is with an inch and an eighth hole, three inches deep. When we plug the hole, it goes back to here. 
So it's returned almost all the way to its original position. So I'm anticipating and we will show you that the two balls without the balance hole and the plug spot will roll about the same. Ryan said that when he threw the ball with the hole in it, it hooked three and two more. Okay. Now the reason it didn't go all the way back is we didn't fill it to the top and the density of the plug is slightly less than the density of the material you removed. But it'll come back 90% of the way. And Ryan said he moved three and two back when he put the balance hole. He moved three and two left when he put the hole in it and he had to move back when he, did, when he, put, when he plugged the hole. Here's where he plugged the hole. Notice, ball doesn't go right and come back. So what are we going to learn? I took a long time to do this because this is critical to symmetrical balls. All right? And you're going to find out a couple of tricks here. Okay, Ryan had to move his feet back to the right. Here's your diagram. Okay? There's the PSA of the drilled ball without the balance hole. Here's the PSA of the drill ball with the balance hole. Okay? Those blue dots is the migrating axis. Showed you how I did the three, the three lines, right? Each one of those dots is 15 degrees. So, the ball had to migrate one, two, three, four, a little over 60 degrees when it precessed before the migrating axis crossed the line from the pin to the PSA. Once I put the hole in it, it only had to go about 35 degrees. So this ball, okay, had the migrating axis cross the line from the, the drill, on the drill ball from the pin to the PSA. We call that the pin to spin line. A bowling ball will rev up when the migrating axis crosses the pin to spin line. End of statement. A bowling ball will rev up when the migrating axis crosses the pin to spin line. That's the laws of the universe. I'm sorry. I don't care how much you run it out or how much you squeeze it, it's going to happen. PSA moved two and a half inches right when the inch and an eighth hole was drilled. This resulted in the ball revving up and reading the lane sooner, creating more overall hook because the ball revs up when the migrating axis crosses the pin to spin line. That's it. With symmetrical balls, that's it. Now, you're not allowed to use a balance hole anymore. So they're all going to spin on the thumb. I don't care how much side weight you got in it. It's going to hook less with the plugged hole than it did when it had the hole in it. That's the important lesson here. We're getting started. We're learning migratory paths, pin to spin lines, determine how balls roll. Okay, here's layout F, 33 and 3 quarters, 20. There you go. Migratory path. I actually measured it on a the ball. They're pretty close. They should be almost identical. So every time I get done with a ball, I put there's five numbers on the ball. Because those numbers tell me what's going on. Okay? And if you don't measure those five numbers, get your Ouija board out. Okay? Positive axis point when you release it. Positive axis point at the oil line, positive axis point at the pins. Okay? The pin is three and three quarters of an inch when he lets go of it. It's three and a quarter at the oil line. It's two and a half at the pins. If that number gets smaller, that ball's going to rev up faster because the core is going to lay down as the ball goes down the lane and the pin is headed to the left edge of the ball. It flared two and a quarter in the oil and three and a half in the dry. That's an important measurement to tell you what the ball's doing. The more the ball flares in the oil, the sooner your break point. The more it flares in the dry, the later and sharper your break point. 
Now, I know I've done this in your shop a lot, and I've done it in your shop a lot. If I get a guy that pays me money to do a lesson, I get that. Every one of them. Because that's the only thing that tells you what's really going on. The Ouija board is necessary for the rest. Okay? There's the migratory path. Now we're going to have him throw it with the CG in the center of the ball. Both those balls rolled the same. One with the CG over in the weeds, one with the CG in the center of the ball, they all rolled the same. On symmetrical balls. On any ball with CGs, because we don't care. Here it is with the CG over here. Three and three quarters, three and a quarter, two and a half. Two and a quarter, three and a half, bingo. CG here, CG there. No hole, they roll identical. Okay. Here's layout B, which is the pin down ball. Didn't say it didn't hit. Smoother. Let's measure it. There's the pin. Five inches to start. Four and a half. Four. So the pin got one inch closer to the track as the ball went down the lane. On the other one, it got an inch and a half closer. Which one's going to have more back end? One with the inch and a half. This one flared an inch and a half in the oil, two and a half in the dry. Oops, didn't flare as much, did it? The other one was two and a quarter and three and a half. That's a big decrease in flare. And the migratory path goes down here under the thumb. The new reality of drilling symmetrical balls. Use the pin to PAP distance and the VAL angle to create the shape of the ball motion. Pin to PAP distance, VAL angle. Now I know storm has numbers, not angles. You know that storm layout system? Everybody uses it, right? You know where you can find the origin of that? It was a book that came out in 1997 called uh, the reality of the 3D offset. And that system was introduced in that book. I wonder who did that. But Storm owns it now. But it's okay. It's another way to do it. I like angles. Tells me what's going on. Place the CG anywhere you or your customer would like to see it. Because it really doesn't matter. Don't argue with the customer. I like it when my CG's over here. Good, put it right there. <laughs> I like it when my CG's over here. Put it right there. Because if it's a symmetrical ball, take the time to try to explain to them, sure, this is exactly what you want. This is what you came here for. I'm going to give you what you want. It really doesn't matter. I can put it anywhere. But if that makes you feel better, I'm okay with that. Got your credit card? <laughs> but take the time to, to explain to them, you're going to learn over time that eventually the CG doesn't matter at all. But up until August 1 of 2020, I can use that path. So. Yes, you can. Now, if you're going to take advantage of that, and he's right, in the interim, that means you have to get the ball with the pin out the right distance so that if you have to pluck a hole in it to get motion, you've got legal static weights. Okay? If you're not going to use a hole, I don't care where the CG is. It can be in the ring finger, it can be in the thumb, it can be over here, it can be over there. Adjust the surface to get the preferred breakpoint distance. The only thing surface does to a bowling ball is it moves the breakpoint either closer to the foul line or closer to the pins. It does not change the shape. It may subtly affect it, but what really changes the shape, pin to PAP distance and the VAL angle. That's where shape comes from. And modern ball motion is less about hook and more about shape because it's how the ball goes through the pins. Very nice job, by the way, on your perception versus reality that you just did. Some balls go off the left side of the lane. Some balls go off the right side of the lane. The new specs that prevent the use of balance holes for symmetrical balls will have two different effects on the resulting ball motion of drilled symmetrical balls. 
The versatility of layouts with symmetrical balls will definitely be limited because of the no balance hole rule. The PSA of every symmetrical ball will be in the area of the thumb hole because we can no longer use the balance hole to move the PSA towards the bowler's axis point. Symmetrical balls will have a later break points resulting in less overall hook. Even if they got three ounces of side weight on them, they're going to hook less. Why? Because the migrating axis is going to cross the pin to spin line later. I don't care. That's the reality of it. Okay, let me draw one conclusion before we go on to ASIMS. The new rule by the USBC severely restricts the versatility of symmetrical balls. You will be drilling many, many more asymmetrical balls than you did in the past. Because if you want motion for your customers, the only way you can move the PSA of a ball is moving, is taking an asymmetrical ball and moving the locator pin around. Okay? It's the only thing that's going to work. I, had a, I have one of our guys that says, well, I like symmetrical balls. I don't like asymmetrical balls. Good. Bring your spare ball. Get your ass kicked by everybody. Go right ahead. But it's real simple. You want to drill an asymmetrical ball so you have the benefit of the asymmetry, but the motion, more, more, more shaped like a symmetrical ball, you know how you do it? You put the locator pin right in the thumb hole. So if they like symmetrical balls and they want motion, in the future, you're going to drill ASIMs, and where are you going to put the PSA? In the thumb hole. If you move it off the thumb hole, you can alter the shape of the motion. That's the biggest difference with the new rules. And I will remind you, it was not my idea. So will Radical offer fewer symmetrical balls? I can't tell you everything we're going to do, but if you hang on, you'll find out. <laughs> okay, we're going to look at asymmetrical balls. Okay. So the pin to PSA, the pin to CG distance on a ball doesn't mean anything anymore. Okay? You're going to have got, by the way, let's get rid of the other myth. Pin down balls don't roll earlier. I'm sorry, that's a lie. That's one of the world's four greatest lies, and we all know what the first three are. Okay? Okay, since that's a myth. Yes. It causes it to roll earlier. It, I see earlier roll. You don't. You see it start to transition sooner, but it takes longer to get done transitioning. What you've got is a longer transition. You're easily fooled. Okay. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Liz Johnson used it last week and crushed them. You want to know why? Because she doesn't hook it. She could get further right and jam it right dead into the track, and she could knock them down. But if you try to, but if you take a pin down ball and try to go around the lane with it, like most of our people do today in the modern generation, bring your spare ball. Pin down balls take longer to transition. Why is that so? Because the drilled numbers of pin down balls are less differentials. They have less intermediate diff and less total diff than that same pin to, pin to PAP distance on a pin up ball. That's why it's true. It starts, but it takes a while. Okay? You can continue to do pin down balls, just sell a lot of spare balls. It'll be fine. Rev dominant players, that's good. I'll give you another one. High track players, do a pin down ball and you can hear the ball hit the pins. <laughs> Goes thump, 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 thump on the back end. And the front end. And on the front end, too. Okay? There is a place for pin down balls. Rev dominant players. Okay? On wet, dry lane conditions. But if somebody actually puts a legal amount of oil out there on the lane, spare balls. RG contours are more elliptical on asymmetrical balls. Therefore, the axis migration path stays closer to the pin, resulting in the ball reading the pattern better and revving up sooner. Remember when I showed you the RG contours way back on those slides? And they were slightly oval? If that was an asymmetrical ball, it would have been very oval. They'd have been real flat ellipses. 
That means that as the migratory path goes from where do you let it go to where it is is the pins, it stays closer to the pin all the way. What does that mean? If it's closer to the pin, when you get to the end of the oil line, it's going to read sooner. That's the law of the universe. Okay, ludicrous layout F, 73 and 3 quarters of 20. Here we go. Migratory pass. It's a straighter line to that finger hole. Pin three and three quarters. Three and three quarters, two and three quarters, two and a quarter. When you get your flash drive and you go back, you will see that the symmetrical ball with that layout at the break point was three and a quarter from the axis. Therefore, the core was still more standing up and hadn't gotten to the left side of the ball soon enough. The other thing would be that the other one, it's got two and a half in the oil and three and a quarter in the dry. Now we got two and a quarter in the oil and four in the dry. The numbers tell you everything. This ball is going to read harder and flip more on the back because it's going to flare more in the dry and less in the oil. Just the way it is, guys. All because this path is less curved and straighter. Okay, here's the pin down, ludicrous. Here's smoother. Here we go. Again, five inches. Three and three quarters, three and a quarter. So the asymmetrical ball went from five inches to three and a quarter. When you look at your flash drive, the symmetrical ball went from five inches to four inches. And this time the migratory path went through the thumb hole instead of underneath it. This is just verification that given if we put the same cover stock on two balls, one symmetrical, one's asymmetrical, Asymmetrical ball is going to read the pattern sooner and roll heavier. And if you want to make an asymmetrical ball roll like a symmetrical ball, what do you do? PSA in the thumb. The new USB-C specs that prevent the use of balance holes will have much less of an effect on asymmetrical balls. This rule will require adjustments to layouts as well as design philosophy for asymmetrical balls. Currently, the lack of a balance hole will result in the maximum flare of a drilled asymmetrical ball being reduced by 25%. That was their goal. I'm about to give them the, race, the racing <laughs> idiom. By the time the no balance hole rule goes in effect, our asymmetrical balls without balance holes will only be 7% less than with a balance hole on them. That's what I do. They always make me go last. For the purists, a rev dominant game, the stronger player, the better player should win, correct? That's the sport of bowling. That's bad for the business of bowling. Because people that aren't that strong, and can't rev it that hard, are going to quit the sport. And in case you haven't figured it out, I'm in the business of bowling. And I believe everybody in this room is in the business of bowling. And for the bowling to succeed, we need hope and heroes. Guy comes in, wants a ball, wants to be competitive, doesn't want to be embarrassed when he goes out there and bowls. You better have the tricks to keep him in play. Because if you, they don't, you know what they're going to do? They're going to turn on their computer next Wednesday night instead of go to the bowling center. <coughs> you want to be pure? That's fine. That's what professional bowling's for. This is the business of bowling. At least last time I checked, I'm in the business of bowling. How about you? All right. Maximum flare is being reduced currently by 25%. 
radical will be able to substantially increase the flare of drilled asymmetrical balls in the future by newly developed core designs. They're already there. We're just finishing them up. We will reduce that 25% disadvantage without a balance hole to 7%. Okay? I can't be responsible for anybody else. We knew that last October, went to work on it. Okay. With the limitations on the motion of symmetrical balls created by the new USB-C spec, we believe the result will be an increase in the percentage of asymmetrical balls being drilled. You ask me that question. Does that make sense to everybody here? Performance differential is a term we use, we were introducing it, to accurately describe the flare of a ball. The true amount of flare of a drill ball is related to both the intermediate and total differential of the ball. Performance differential of the drilled ball measures the relationship between the intermediate and total drift differential to give an accurate measure of the amount of flare the drill ball will have. There is a Pythagorean relationship between the intermediate and total diff, which means it's the square root of the sum of the squares. If we are limited on how much total diff we can generate in a drilled ball, we better use the intermediate diff to make it stronger, hadn't we? I guess that's why asymmetrical balls are going to be around more than symmetrical balls. Okay. You saw it on the diagram up there. The X on the following diagrams indicates the preferred spin axis, PSA, mass bias, of the drill ball. A line from the pin after drilling to the PSA after drilling is referred to as the pin to spin line. A ball will rev up when the migrating axis crosses the pin to spin line. We just spent a whole time learning that, right? Adjustments to change ball motion. Here's your question and answer. Adjusting the VAL angle. Decreasing the VAL angle will result in a shorter, sharper break point. So you look at your layout, you got your VAL angle, the last angle. If you reduce it, you're going to get a sharper later, a shorter, sharper break point. It's going to kick on the back. If you increase the VAL angle, you're going to get a longer, smoother break point. So if that layout suggests 35 degrees VAL angle, okay? And you've got somebody that needs help. They're right up the back of it. Do it with a 25 degree VAL angle. It'll help them. You've got somebody gets around it real good. You need control. It says 35, go to 45. So just play with the VAL angle to change the shape of the break point. Twenty degrees is as close as you want to get. If you get any closer than twenty degrees, you can have the ball flaring up on the bottom of the thumb hole as it gets to the pins, because you got a bow tie point up and a bow tie point down. As you get smaller with your VAL angle, those bow tie points ro rotate up, and you can actually flare up over the bottom of the thumb. You, I've had it happen to me a couple times. You've seen it happen. So you get a guy and he's. He's throwing it, it's going boom, boom, boom on the end. You take a look at it, and if those oil rings on the bottom are starting to flare up over the bottom of the thumb, that means you can't use that small a VAL angle. Those are extreme cases, okay? What's really good about most of those cases is they throw it with two hands, there's no thumb hole anyway. <laughs> okay. Adjustments to the pin to PAP distance. Decreasing the pin to PAP distance will result in the ball going more sideways at the break point because the core will lay down faster as it gets down the lane and suck the ball left. As increasing the pin to PAP, that's a minimum of three and a half inches, okay? Increasing the pin to PAP distance will result in the ball rolling more forward at the break point. Maximum I like to use is five and a half. I get a little twitchy if it gets more than five and a half especially if the guy's got three degrees of tilt. I can't wait for the thump. The Jabberwocky went bump in the night. We don't want the bowling ball to join the Jabberwocky. Okay. And then the exception are the short pin layouts. And please don't tell me this is rocket science. Adjusting the surface of the ball. Adding surface will move the break point closer to the foul line. Decreasing surface will make it closer to the pins. Okay. In order to maximize the performance differential of drilled balls under the new USB-C specs, okay, 
How do we help increase the performance differential? Number one, drill finger holes only deep enough to accommodate the entire insert. I hate cutting inserts. <laughs> Put the whole thing in there. Drill the thumb assembly the proper depth for the assembly. Then take the next smaller size drill bit and drill it an extra inch and a quarter deep. You cannot do that with an IT. But with switch grips and with Ultimate, you can do it. The USB-C has gone on record as saying changing the depths of finger holes and thumb holes don't have any effect on ball motion. I call that an oops. You'll add five points to the drill differential of a ball by drilling the thumb hole all the way to the middle of the ball. One size smaller so that the assembly stops at the right place, inch and a quarter deep. Go ahead. I, what I would do with slugs right now, I would use inch and a half slugs on everything. <laughs> then you go inch and three eighths. Then you go inch and three eighths underneath. I would use inch and a half slugs. They're making us get a little better. They're telling us we have to get better at what we do. They put a lot of stress on our industry. How much more top weight do the fingers buy that? <clears throat> Doesn't mean anything. How much top weight doesn't make any difference. Here's the thing that we haven't told you yet. 90% of the bowling balls we produce will have less than three ounces of top weight on drilled. Okay? That's the answer. I don't care if you put the CG on the left side, the right side, above the fingers, below the thumb. The only way you can drill a ball that has less than three ounces of top weight then make it illegal is to put it on the bottom of the ball because you have more bottom weight. It's critical to the success of the business of bowling that we be good at this. That's why Brian Graham asked me to commit to it. My boss knew what was coming along. Okay, I'm not responsible for anybody else. Like the USBC, they did their balance hole study now. We did it in 73. I don't know what the other companies are going to do. I'm sure they're going to do and say something. But we were first. This is important to the success of our industry. Okay. These two procedures will maximize the performance differential of all layouts without a balance hole. Me, personally, when looking at the layouts that I wrote, I would say that if I'm going to do a ball for somebody and not use the most aggressive drillings, I wouldn't worry about the extra points. But when I get up to layout E, F, D, E, F, and, e, F, and G, I'd be using deep thumb holes if possible. But that was a good question. The bigger the slug you use, the more the performance differential of the drill ball will be. Excellent point. This would probably be more pertinent, more get the symmetric for it, more performance by drilling that deep hole. That's correct. I would, my personally, I'd use the deeper thumb hole on every symmetrical ball I drilled. Because it's going to need help. That's a good point. Symmetrical balls probably need the performance differential maximized more often than asymmetricals. Asymmetricals when you're trying to give the, the bowler the most. Radicals planned response to new USB-C specs. Okay? I'm not speaking for anybody else. This is us. I'm not even speaking for Brunswick and DV8. I'm radical. Everybody agree with that? I'm radical? Okay. For years. Okay, number one. First thing we want to do is educate pro shops about the effects of the new specifications. I rest my case. Number two. Provide a system of layouts that do not require balance holes. I rest my case. This is not for your customer. Develop effective core designs that have increased track flare without the use of balance holes. We'll be down to 7% in two years. Develop an organized system of effective, logical, and easy to understand ball designs. Cannot get into the detail of that, but we are well into that procedure right now. We will have categories of bowling balls. We will tell you what they are. And you will know by the category of the bowling ball what the performance potential of the ball is. Okay, I can tell you what one of them is. 
True symmetrical balls. That's the bottom of the barrel. I can tell you what a second category is. Strong asymmetrical balls. You have no idea. Okay? And then we'll have different categories in between. We're still working out the logistics of actually what it is. But you're going to be, the ball's going to come and it's going to tell you what type of ball it is. Don't ask it to do something that that type doesn't do. When I explain this to my boss, and he's everybody else's boss in this room that I have a Brunswick shirt on, he says, this makes sense. We think the pro shops will like this. They like organized. So you, and you can explain to the customer what it is. Don't that, ask a seven iron to be a driver. Exactly. We don't have too many Dustin Johnsons in this room, do we? Club head speeds of 120 miles an hour. That's a little tricky, isn't it? <laughs> Us mere mortals can't do that. <coughs> I repeat, it was not my idea. It's my job to fix it. I will stand behind everything that's in this presentation, and Radical will too. Okay, all I'm going to ask you for, when we had the discussion on this, at the expense and everything that goes on with it, right? is that you give consideration to what we're doing and what we're trying to do. I would like to thank my team without whom this couldn't have happened. Number one member of my team, right over here, Bruns Nick Smith. Bruns, Bruns Nick is the guy who puts all of our stuff on the videos, perception versus reality, all the other stuff. I'm going to stay here and congratulate you and thank you very much for what you do. Thank you very much. Ryan Mao. He's Throwbot. I call him Flowbot because he's a little smoother than Throwbot. My guys will meet him tomorrow in Columbus. His name is Stevie Fresh. He's been my CAD designer for over a decade now, longer than a decade. He is the best CAD person in the bowling industry, I absolutely promise you. He has a master's in applied mathematics from LSU, and he does CAD designs. And all this intricate diagrams and all the stuff we do that gives you a little point here, a point there. That's what we do. He's great. And I'm only as good as the team. I just happen to have the biggest mouth in town. Okay. We want to thank you for attending this presentation. Your interest in the success of our sport. The success of our sport is league and competitive bowling. Open play will take care of itself. Personally, I'm just going to thank you for listening to me. I hope this is, was of value, and when you leave here, you think it was worth your time, because your time is valuable. Thank you very much.